All right, well, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, once again Dr. Andy Woods coming to you with Pastor's Point of View. Uh, we typically do this on a Friday, but our office is closed tomorrow, so we thought we would jam one in before the week ended. And uh, I'm the pastor teacher here at Sugarland Bible Church, and I'm here with my friend, colleague, uh, associate pastor, fellow elder, um, Dr. Jim McGowan. And so I want to welcome you back. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. And, you know, the last time we were together, we were talking about some things that have come into people's lives by way of Bible prophecy when it's yeah. not taught correctly. It throws God's people into kind of a um, <clears throat> unnecessary state of confusion. Absolutely. And there's a couple of verses that I think are important on that. Uh, one is Second Thessalonians 2. And verse 2, uh, would you mind reading that for us? Glad to do so. We're reading from the New American Standard Version 1995 update, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. That you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. See, we don't, we don't think Bible prophecy and your view on it uh, determines your justification before God. You know, right. I came to Christ by faith alone, having all kinds of weird ideas in my head about Bible prophecy. Sure. And so, but in the process of growth, you know, God started to kind of sort things out for me Yes. through a literal, re literal reading of His Word. Mm -hmm. But we do believe this, that if you have a wrong view of prophecy, you can get shaken. Yes. And Paul here is writing to Christians. He's not dealing yes, he with is. a loss of salvation. <clears throat> right. It's actually dealing with here in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, a forged letter contradicting what Paul had said in the prior letter. Mm -hmm. And in his first, let's see, this would be his second missionary journey when he planted the church at uh, Thessalonica. And he had taught them that they would escape the tribulation. And then he had been forced out, and while he was gone, a letter showed up, allegedly coming from Paul, contradicting what he had taught, taught them previously, that right. they were in the day of the Lord. Yes, yes. And so these folks, and I like this word that's used here, were, were shaken. Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't unsaved, but they were just, uh, had a lot of anxiety about things that they shouldn't have been anxious about. Well, we use a we use a phrase today that it, it shake it shook me to the core. Yeah, and I think that's what he's saying here. Yeah, exactly, because that same word "shaken" in Greek is used of a violent earthquake. Yes, mm -hmm. in fact, a great earthquake in the Philippian jail, Acts sixteen verse twenty six. Same yes. Greek word. You mind reading Acts sixteen verse twenty six? Certainly, Acts sixteen twenty six. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. So shaken there is the same word used in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2. In other words, what had happened in Thessalonica was a theological earthquake. Yeah, that's a good way on. to look at it. And these people were having trouble, you know, growing in Christ because mm -hmm. of wrong prophetic teaching yes. that they were being influenced by. So the last time we were together, we were talking about a couple of issues. And a lot of people thought that last week we were targeting a particular ministry and a particular conference. And we were not doing that. Uh, these are things that I've really heard my whole Christian life. Right. And they had to do with if you're a unbeliever and you hear the gospel and reject it mm -hmm. and you miss the rapture, you can't be saved in the tribulation period. So we dealt with right. that subject. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's another teaching floating around out there that if you teach millennial evangelism uh, in the millennial kingdom, then somehow you're giving people today a second chance to believe the gospel. Right. And it lessens the urgency of the gospel today. So yeah. we dealt with that issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's another one. And again, this is not something that comes from a particular conference. Because every time you do a correction like this, everybody tries to defend their favorite teacher. Yes. Well, you can't do that here because we're not targeting a particular teacher. 
uh, these are things generically floating around. I've mm -hmm. heard these things for the last 20 years. Oh, oh yeah, me too. Since I was a, a kid, I, I remember hearing these kinds of things from the pulpit. Yeah. And this particular <clears throat> one, we're dealing with the parable of the ten virgins. Mm -hmm. And I've dealt with a number of people that are in absolute fear related to this parable of the ten virgins. Mm -hmm. yes. Because they think that the parable of the ten virgins is about the rapture. Right. And they think that if their life is not completely upright before God at the time of the rapture, mm -hmm. then somehow they're not going to be taken in the rapture. Right. And that's what you call the partial rapture theory, mm -hmm. that when the rapture occurs, it's only for the believers that are 100% submitted to the Lordship of Christ. Yeah. I mean, how could anybody, how could you determine if you're in that camp or not? I couldn't. I couldn't either. <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is everybody who teaches this theory, I've, I've come to believe, they always believe that they personally are in the camp that's leaving, mm -hmm. not in the camp yeah. that's left behind. Yeah. Yeah. So the rest of us, I guess, uh, need uh, to be in fear because folks. we might yeah. miss the rapture. And you ask them for biblical proof, and they all quote this parable of the ten virgins. Mm -hmm. So we'd kind of like to put that in its proper theological context today. Amen. To hopefully alleviate some unnecessary <clears throat> fear. Now, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be also sharing with you today what you ought to be concerned about. Not mm -hmm. the parable of the ten virgins missing the rapture, right. but something called the Bama Seat Judgment of Christ, that's, that's right. which is an issue of rewards, yes. not heaven or hell. So with that being said, uh, folks might want to open your Bibles to Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, as we try to dispel some of the false teaching out there associated with the parable of the ten virgins. In fact, the very first encounter I had with this was with a friend of mine in California. And this particular friend had been influenced by a group called the Local Church. You ever heard of that yes, group? Yes, I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And very early on in this person's Christian walk, they had been taught that there were going to be three raptures, mm -hmm. you know, and one is for the overcomers, the other one is for not the overcomers, mm -hmm. and then somehow there's a third one, mm -hmm. and the local church, quote, was te not a local church, but a group that literally had the title, mm -hmm. the local church. Yeah was teaching this particular person that if you uh, are one of these five unwise virgins, you're not going to be taken in the first rapture, mm -hmm. but you're going to be taken in the second rapture after the tribulation period straightens you out. And they were basing this whole thing on the parable of the ten virgins. And this is how this particular group was getting people to come back every week out of fear, because if you're not an overcomer, you're not going to be taken in the first rapture. I kind of wonder if maybe they also taught that in order to be a member of the first group, you had to be a member of their church. Probably, and I don't have it enough. Kind of generally operates that way. Yeah, doesn't it? and I don't have enough expertise, you know, with this group to know. But what's been relayed to me is this was a tool to scare people. Sure. To get them to come back, and mm -hmm. you know, so you get people serving the Lord not out of gratitude and worship, mm -hmm. but out of a state of fear. Absolutely. Yes. So, is there a biblical support for this partial rapture uh, concept? Uh, why don't we read Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, and see if we can decipher this. All right, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flask along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight... Wait, wait, hold back. How many of them got drowsy? Well, let me see here. Let's look at that. Oh, they all got drowsy. That would be all ten, right? That, that all would be all ten, okay. yes. Okay, that's mm -hmm. first... Yeah. Five. That's verse five. We'll be, so, we'll be coming back to that. Yep, Go ahead. Yep. They all got so the what? While the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout: "Behold, the bridegroom! Come out to meet him!" Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, "Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out." But the prudent answered, "No, there will not be enough for us and you too." Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. 
And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So this is interpreted by many as the rapture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who's Jesus coming back for in the rapture? Not the foolish, but the wise. And so if you're in a state of being backslidden as a Christian, maybe you had a carnal thought, uh -oh. Maybe you watched a movie you shouldn't have watched, or you're right there in the middle of that movie house or theater when the rapture occurs. You're not going to be taken in the rapture. Yeah. This is how this is treated by yeah. many, many groups. <clears throat> now, if we can put up slide number one, we have a graphic there. And I want to teach people very quickly the difference between the Olivet Discourse, where this story is found, mm -hmm. and the Upper Room Discourse. Yes because those are two completely different discourses that have two completely different purposes. Yes. The Olivet Discourse is found in Matthew 24 and 25. The Upper Room Discourse is in John 13 through 17. The location of the Olivet Discourse is in the Mount of Olives. That's what we're reading from, the Olivet Discourse. Mm -hmm. The location of the Upper Room Discourse is obviously in the Upper Room. Mm -hmm. The Olivet Discourse was given on the third day of the Passion Week, the final week before Christ's you know, crucifixion, resurrection, etc. The Upper Room Discourse was given on the sixth day of the Passion Week. So different times of the week these mm -hmm. two discourses were given, different locations and they're recorded in different sections of Scripture. The general focus of the Olivet Discourse is a farewell address, and we'll demonstrate this today, to the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Jesus is saying goodbye to Israel, and he outlines her future. And in fact, do you mind uh, reading Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, which precedes the um, Olivet Discourse? I don't think I have that there on our sheet, but just spontaneously, would you mind reading that? 37 through 39? Please. <clears throat> Matthew 23. Let me get over there. 37. Okay, yes. This is the lament over Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." So Jesus is speaking. Mm -hmm. He's speaking to Israel yes. because it says Jerusalem, Jerusalem in verse 37. He says, I wanted to gather mm -hmm. you. Now that's the word uh, epi-sunago. Mm -hmm. And from that word we get the word English word synagogue, right. which is a Jewish gathering. I wanted to have synagogue with you. I wanted to gather you when I came the first time. Yes. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. The problem wasn't me, Jesus says. The problem was you. Yes. You were unwilling, That's right. talking about national Israel's leadership's rejection of Christ at the first advent. Yes. So they're going to go through discipline now because that's what's spelled out for them in their Mosaic Covenant. Right. Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68. And part of that discipline is your house, the temple. It's called your house because they kicked him out. So mm -hmm. it's not my father's house anymore, right. it's your house. Right. It is left to you desolate, speaking of the destruction that the nation would experience in AD 70. Yes. The destruction of the temple. <clears throat> and a lot of people uh, stop reading there. But verse 39 says, for, for I say to you, you will not see me. From now on you will not see me. And don't stop reading there. Look mm -hmm. at the word until. Right. Until you that's Israel, mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Psalm 118, verse 26, which mm -hmm. is a messianic psalm. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's where you put your Romans 10, 9, and 10, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a whole other topic. 
but uh, basically he's saying, I'm not coming back for this nation to gather you until you publicly acknowledge me as your Messiah. Yes. Now that statement that he makes flows very nicely into the Olivet Discourse. It does. Where he develops <clears throat> the circumstances by which the nation of Israel will come to faith yes. in the tribulation period, yes. at least a remnant, and they will crawl Christ back to the earth, and they will, verse 31, be gathered. Look at Matthew mm -hmm. 24, 31. He will send forth his angels mm -hmm. with a great trumpet, and they will gather. That's yeah. the same word, episunago. Yes. Together, the elect Israel, as we'll show today, from mm -hmm. the four winds of the earth, uh, four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So yes. the whole focus of the Matthew 24, 25 is his farewell to Israel mm -hmm. and the circumstances by which they will acknowledge him as the Messiah. Yes. The focus of the upper room discourse, again, looking at our graphic, is not a farewell to Israel. It's a hello to the church mm -hmm. that's yet to come. And it's here that Jesus plants multiple doctrines that are planted in seed form mm -hmm. for the age of the church, mm -hmm. which the Apostle Paul and the rest of the apostles would water yes. through their writings and bring to fullness. Yes. The specific focus of the Olivet Discourse is Israel's future. Mm -hmm. The specific focus of the Upper Room Discourse is the divine provisions for the church age yes. that hadn't been explained thus far, right. the coming church age. Yeah. The mystery. Huh? The mystery, and that's where he begins <clears throat> to talk about divine provisions, such as it's to your advantage that I go away, because yes. when I go away, the paraclete or the helper will come. And that's when he talks about how he will live inside of the believer yes. forever. Yes. And what prompted the Olivet Discourse? Well, there were some questions about the temple's destruction. Mm -hmm. Matthew 24, 1 through 3, what prompted the uh, upper room discourse is there was concerns that Jesus was leaving. Yes. Because he told him he was leaving, right. and here he starts to express the fact that it's to your advantage that I'm leaving. Right. Because the paraclete will come. The Olivet Discourse deals with Old Testament material. It's an amplification of Israel's program as already revealed in the Old Testament. Yeah. The Upper Room Discourse is not about that at all. It's unwritten material, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> that's why he doesn't make a lot of citations in the Upper Room Discourse to Scripture, although he does some a little bit. He's talking about the Scripture yet to be written. Right. Yes. So why, why give folks this chart? And here's why we mention it. If you're fishing for truths about the rapture, in the Olivet Discourse, rather than the Upper Room Discourse, mm -hmm. you're fishing in the wrong pond. That's right. Because the Olivet Discourse is not set up to answer rapture questions. Right. The Upper Room Discourse <clears throat> is set up to answer all church age questions, including the rapture. Mm -hmm. And if you want to find Christ's first teaching on the rapture, don't look at Matthew 24 and 25. Right. you got to look at John 14, 14 yeah. 1 through Three. Mm -hmm. And so you see the problem here, Brother Jim, yes. is when people are going to this parable of the ten virgins to develop a theory of the rapture, they're fishing in the wrong pond. Yeah. And consequently, what you have when you fish in the wrong pond, you know what you have to settle with? Things that look similar to the rapture, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> are not on all, as we say in the legal system, on all fours. Yeah. In other words, you, you settle for things that kind of look like the rapture, but really don't fully describe the rapture. Yeah. And I'm convinced that because this issue here is not explained to people, uh, people are going to all kinds of places in the Bible to find truths about the rapture, like the parable of the ten virgins, yeah. and they're basically fishing you know, in the wrong pond. So, you know, when you fish in the wrong pond, you get a boot. <laughs> That's right. When you fish in the right pond, Bingo. you get a fish. Well said. You said there in about two seconds, but it took me about <laughs> 20 minutes to articulate. So very, very nice. <laughs> now, what then is Matthew 25, 1 through 13 dealing with? In fact, to be honest with you folks, what is the, the, the totality, 99% of Matthew 24 and 25 dealing with? 
after you get beyond the initial questions, mm -hmm. it's not dealing with the age, end of the age of the church. Right. It's dealing mm -hmm. with the end of the inner Advent age. Mm -hmm. Now, those are two completely different things. Yes. The inner Advent age is the time period between Christ's first coming and second Advent at the end of the tribulation period, mm -hmm. inner Advent age. Mm -hmm. The church age is a parenthetical marker that's slightly more defined within those outer limits that I just mentioned. It's mm -hmm. from Acts 2 to the rapture. Mm -hmm. You want to find information about the church age, go to John 13 through 17. Right. If you want to find information about the inner Advent age, things that will be happening on the earth via the tribulation period and the establishment of the kingdom after the church has already been raptured, then you go to Matthew 24 and 25. Amen. Yes. And something else, if we can put up slide number two, something else to understand about the Olivet Discourse is it's one discourse. There's not two discourses here. Because what a lot of people do is they see the, ch the chapter marker. Now, do we all understand that the Holy Spirit didn't put that chapter marker there? Say, what? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know the background of how these... Th th this was a guy named Stephen <clears throat> Langton. Yeah. Uh, as I understand it, what, in the 16th century, 17th century, uh, yeah. something mm -hmm. like that, on a mm -hmm. carriage ride. Because back then, that's how you traveled. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of time on his hands, but there was a lot of bumps on the road too, right? <laughs> He's the guy that was responsible for putting these chapter divisions in the Bible. A lot of the time, the chapter divisions are very, very helpful, mm -hmm. but sometimes they unnaturally bifurcate information in our minds. That's true. Uh, so chapter 20, you know, you got to read this as if that chapter division isn't even there. Mm -hmm. And this is all one discourse. And you'll notice here from slide 2, that in Matthew's Gospel, there are five discourses. Five major discourses. Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. Missions Discourse, chapter 10. Kingdom Parables, chapter 13. Humility Discourse, chapter 18. And then the Olivet Discourse, chapters 24 and 25. And you say, well, how do you know there's only five major discourses in Matthew's Gospel? Because Matthew gives you a structural clue. What might that be? At the end of each major discourse, he has these words, or a rough paraphrase of them, when Jesus had finished saying these things. Yeah. So you'll find that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 28. At the end of the Missions Discourse, chapter 11, verse 1. At the end of the Kingdom Parables, chapter 13, verse 53, at the end of the Humility Discourse, chapter 19, verse 1, at the end of the Olivet Discourse, chapter 26, verse 1. What's my point? My point is, just as I would take the whole Sermon on the Mount as a unit, the Missions Discourse as a unit, the Kingdom Parables as a unit, the Humility Discourse as a unit, I've got to take the all of it, discourse as a unit. Right. In other words, we pay attention to the structural <clears throat> markers in the biblical mm -hmm. text rather than an artificial division created by somebody, you know, in the 16th or 17th century. Right. And why is this important? Because people aren't paying attention to who this discourse was given in chapter 24. Right. Mm -hmm. So they go to chapter 25, <clears throat> and supposedly that's different in their minds because yeah. it's a different chapter. And they start applying... See, chapter 24 is clearly Israel, as we'll show. Yes. Then they say, well, chapter 25, he's obviously on to something different. He's on church-age truth. Mm -hmm. No, that's not how mm -hmm. you interpret this discourse or any other discourse. Whatever you're doing in chapter 25 has to be consistent with the context of chapter 24. Mm -hmm. are, are you with me on well, that? One would think that to be the case. Yes, yes. sir. So... When we go to the Olivet Discourse itself, let's try to figure out who this is written to. Would you mind reading Matthew 24, verses 1 through 3? All right. Matthew 24, verses 1 through, 1 through 3, you said. Jesus came out from the temple, oh, there's an indicator there, and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? 
Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Now, it's really interesting to me, he says they came to him privately. So maybe this shouldn't even be called the Olivet Discourse, like he was given some kind of public sermon, mm -hmm. like on the Sermon on the Mount. This is more like a con private conversation. Right, right. But you uh, raised the perfect issue, a uh, perfect point, because it mentions temple, mm -hmm. verse 1. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it mentions it again. Where yeah, temple buildings in the same temple verse. Temple buildings, the same verse. The temple is Jewish. It's Hebrew. Absolutely. So they're asking a Hebrew question, mm -hmm. a question that would relate to Israel. That's right. And they were very proud of that temple. This would be Temple 2 that Herod had <clears throat> refurbished. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says the whole thing's about to be wiped out. Why? Because of what he spoke back in verse 38 of the prior chapter. Your house will be left desolate. Right, yes. The Romans are going to come about 40 years later under Titus and dismantle the temple brick by brick. Yes. That literally happened, by the way. Mm -hmm. There's actually uh, uh, remnants of that in the nation of Israel in Jerusalem today, you know, mm -hmm. that you can see. And then the disciples said there in verse 3, well, what's the sign of the end of the age? Because, gosh, the temple's everything. So if the mm -hmm. temple's going to be destroyed, that's got to usher in the end of the age. And I think what Jesus does is he captures that concept of the end of the age and says, okay, let me tell you about the end of the age. Mm -hmm. And he starts to map out the tribulation period yet future. Mm -hmm. Now, did the disciples understand all of these things about the tribulation period? They probably should have based on their own prophecies. Right, Old Testament prophecies. Uh, but yeah. I think this is the direction <clears throat> Jesus is going in. So the whole Olivet Discourse is about a Jewish issue. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Now, slip down, if you could, to Matthew 24 and verse 14, and we're going to be referencing here slides 3 and 4. All right, before I do that, just very quickly, I, I just have to read verse 4. Please. He says, And Jesus answered and said to them, so we're same, same topic here, See to it that no one misleads you. I wonder <laughs> if anybody ever reads that verse. All right, over to verse 14. Mm -hmm. This gospel of the kingdom Great point, by the way. shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, gospel of the kingdom. <clears throat> do, you, do you go around, folks, preaching the gospel of the kingdom today to people? I hope you don't, because that concerns Israel. Right. In fact, if you look at slide three, this was what John the Baptist preached, Matthew 3, verse 2. Mm-hmm. What Jesus preached, Matthew 4, verse 17. What the 12 preached, Matthew 10, 5, and 7. And what the 70 preached, Luke 10, verse 1, and verse 9. This is, mm -hmm. the, this is not so much, uh, this is national, what they were preaching. Right. What they were saying mm -hmm. is the king is here, enthrone mm -hmm. Israel, the king on the king's terms, and the, the long-awaited kingdom that's earthly and well developed in your own Old Testament will appear. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear as you look at slide number four, Matthew 10, verses five through seven. Do you mind reading Matthew 10, five through seven? All right. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I mean, is this what you're going to read at your missions conference? Yeah. Uh, obviously not, <clears throat> because uh, he says, as they're offering the kingdom, do not go the way of the Gentiles, Oops. nor the Samaritans but rather go exclusively to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when you go preach, say, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, if they had received the king on the king's terms, they could have had the kingdom. Absolutely right. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. Matthew 12 is the turning point. They rejected that offer. Right. That's when the religious leaders attributed his miracles to Satan. Mm-hmm. And the turning point is in Matthew 12, verse 24. And what you'll see in Matthew's gospel is that offer is withdrawn. Right. 
he starts to develop a new body called the church, or prepare them anyway, mm -hmm. for their role in the church age. And by the time you get to the end of Matthew's gospel, he's giving the church its instructions to go into the whole world, mm -hmm. make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. Now, you'll notice that in the tribulation period, <clears throat> the gospel of the kingdom, which we're not preaching today, mm -hmm. You know, when the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? He didn't say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. No, he didn't. And certainly he was in Philippi when he said that, far outside the borders of Israel. Yeah. Instead, he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Yes. That's, that's the gospel of grace that we preach today. Amen. Because the offer of the kingdom has <clears throat> been withdrawn. Yes. But what we discover in Matthew 24, answering Jewish questions, is that kingdom offer is going to be re-extended to Israel mm -hmm. in the tribulation period, and that's what you're seeing there in verse 14. Yes. This gospel of the kingdom, mm -hmm. that is Jewish in nature, and that's another hint, I believe, that the focus of Matthew 24 and 25 is Hebrew. Mm -hmm. See that? Yes. Jewish. Mm -hmm. Now, having said all that, go down to verse, uh, if you don't mind, verse 15 and read that. And as you're reading that, we're going to be putting up slide number five. All right, Matthew 24, 15, which comes after verse 14. Amen. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So he's quoting here the prophet Daniel. Mm -hmm. And he's quoting a very important prophecy, Daniel 9, verse 27. Right. And he's talking about the desecration of the temple by mm -hmm. the Antichrist mm -hmm. in the middle of the tribulation period. Right. And people say, well, prophecy mm -hmm. is just too hard to understand. I mean, who can understand it? It's so complicated. Well, then why did this why is this little parenthetical marker in here? Let the reader understand. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I don't think it, this, all this stuff is as <clears throat> rocket science as everybody is making it out to be. Nope. And he's quoting Daniel 9.27, and you'll notice from Daniel 9.24, which is the part of that 70 weeks prophecy, that the 70 weeks, 69 weeks or 483 years have passed, one week or seven years yet future. Mm -hmm. That whole package, as Gabriel was giving to Daniel this vision from God, that whole package is for who? For your people and your holy city, Daniel is being spoken to here. He's right. a Hebrew. Mm -hmm. he, his people are the Hebrew people, the physical right. descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And your holy city mm -hmm. is a reference to the city of Jerusalem. Right. And that prophecy was given to <clears throat> Daniel when he was 300 or so miles to the east in Babylonian captivity, mm -hmm. showing him that God is not finished with Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar has just destroyed. Yeah. So the fact that Daniel 9.27 is referenced here by Christ further adds flavor that Matthew 24 is mm -hmm. dealing with the Jewish people. Exactly. This, this is not church age concepts here. Right. These are Hebrew, Jewish concepts. Yes. Can you read, if you don't mind, verses 21 <clears throat> and 22? And as you're doing that, can we put up slide 6? All right, still in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. He's talking about a time of unparalleled <clears throat> mm -hmm. distress for the Jewish people mm -hmm. through which the remnant of Israel will be converted. Yes. Now, a lot of people read that and they think Jesus here is disclosing something brand new. Mm -hmm. He's not. I believe in Christ's mind as he was articulating this time of unparalleled distress, he had in his mind something that the prophet Jeremiah said in chapter 30, verse 7. And if we can put up slide number 6 as we're reading Jeremiah 30, verse 7. You see, Jeremiah, all the way back in the 6th century B.C., spoke of this time of unparalleled distress. Yes. 
as I believe did other prophets like the prophet Joel, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. So and and of course the prophet Daniel did as yes. well. Yeah, go ahead and read Jeremiah 30, verse 7. All right, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. Uh, there's none like it, an unparalleled time of distress. Mm -hmm. That's what we have described here. That's what we have described mm -hmm. in Matthew 24, 21, and 22. What's the mm -hmm. purpose of it? Jacob's distress... Mm -hmm. He will be saved from it. Mm -hmm. Now, who is Jacob? Well, according to the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verse 8, and chapter 35, verse 10, Jacob is another name for Israel. In fact, that's mm -hmm. what Jacob's name was changed to in those chapters. That's right. So the whole time period is for Israel, and through it, the salvation of the remnant of mm -hmm. the nation of Israel. Just simply mm -hmm. demonstrating, folks, how to read this discourse. It's all Jewish, yes. revealing Jewish material, not church-age truth. If I wanted mm -hmm. church-age truth, I'd read a different discourse. Right. Read the Upper Room Discourse. Yes. Can you read Matthew <clears throat> 24 and verse 30? All right. Matthew 24, verse 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky... And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Well, who's going to mourn? It says all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now, doesn't tribes kind of sound Jewish to you? It does. Yeah. yeah. Because after all, the nation was divided into the 12 tribes. It was. And yes. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. And that's all right. And they will see that the, these tribes, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And having said that, read uh, verse 31, the very next verse, if you don't mind. All right, verse 31. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Rapture, 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 rapture. Oops. That's how most people read that. Yeah, that's what they think. There's a trumpet. Yeah, that's true. And there's a gathering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but here's the problem, mm. folks. Um, <clears throat> Jesus is talking to Jews about Israel's future. Mm -hmm. He's not revealing here rapture concepts. Yep. In fact, to discover what Christ meant here, you, you need look no further than Isaiah 11 and <clears throat> verses 11 and 12, because there's a reference there to the regathering uh, of the nation of Israel, Isaiah 11, mm -hmm. uh, verses 11 and 12. Do you have that somewhere on your sheet? Right there, I have it. Isaiah 11, verses 11 through 12. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with His hand the remnant of His people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathras, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Doesn't that sound a lot like verse Goodness th gracious. 31? Look at that. From the four winds, uh -huh, and one end of the sky to the other, and then here from the four corners of the earth. And would his audience have understood these verses? Of course they would have. Yeah, that's it's one of their right. key writing prophets. That's right. Mm -hmm. going 700 mm -hmm. years backwards. Mm -hmm. And so the background for verse 31 has nothing to do with the rapture. Mm -hmm. The background of it is Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And there's more. Mm -hmm. He's probably also alluding to Isaiah 27, mm -hmm. verse 13, the regathering of believing Israel in the last days at the end of the tribulation period. Do you mind reading that? Isaiah 27, verse three, 13, rather. It will come about also in that day that a great trumpet... A great what? That sounds familiar. A great, a great, tr great trumpet. So, there's, so wait, hold the phone here. Long before <laughs> Paul talked about the last trump yeah. for the age of the church, yeah. which is a completely different trump, yeah. there was already in place another trumpet yeah. following Paul's trumpet mm -hmm. for the nation of Israel. Isn't that interesting? And I think people... There's more than one trump in the Bible. There is. Now, we have a Trump in our White House. No, we do. Uh, but there's more than one Trump, and there's only one of those, right? 
Yeah. And a lot of people would like that or not like that, depending on their political <laughs> persuasion. But in the Bible, there are multiple Trumps. Mm -hmm. So keep your Trumps straight or you're going to be forever confused on the subject of the rapture and the devil is going to put you into an unnecessary state of fear because you haven't learned the elementary principles of rightly dividing God's Word, which is what we're teaching today. And you know, Pastor, I'm convinced that a lot of the reasons why people have struggled with these things is they don't know the Old Testament. Yeah. See, if they understood how the New Testament builds on the Old Testament, takes from the Old Testament what it's saying and applies it, you know, bingo. you have to have that understanding. And when Christ is addressing this subject, he's referencing Old Testament material that his audience would well know. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. that's the only scripture Absolutely. they had up to that point that's, in time. That's right. All right. Can, uh, I'm <clears throat> sorry to interrupt you. Uh, did you read 27.13? I did. Okay. Now, he's also alluding <clears throat> to one more from Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 5 through 7. i got to shift and get... Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I'm getting pumped up here, mm -hmm. Pastor. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 43, verses 5 through 7. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. See, this is the synagogue the gathering yeah. that he wanted to have with them back yeah. in his first coming mm -hmm. in Matthew 23, 37. They yeah. wouldn't have him. Yeah. So what's being described here is the gathering or the synagogue, mm -hmm. epi-sunagoge, or let's see if I'm even pronouncing that right, sunago, I think it is, mm -hmm. uh, with them at, his, at the second coming. And that's what verse 31 is talking about. And the mm -hmm. background for it is Isaiah 43, 5 through 7. Isaiah 27, verse 13, and Isaiah 11, 11, and 12. Everything we've read in this discourse concerns Israel. Yes. Now, having said all that, can you, this is, if this won't, if what we've said thus far does not convince you, <laughs> then I think this one likely will. If this won't convince you, then I don't think anything will convince me convince you. Can you read verse 20? Matthew 24, verse 20. All right. Now, this is this uh, verse 20 comes after 15, which talked about the abomination of desolation, just to get our context again. And here's what it says. It says, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter. And there's not a period there. There's a comma. <laughs> or on a Sabbath. Now, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is the sixth day of the week, isn't it? Mm-hmm. The Sabbath <clears throat> is Saturday. The Sabbath, going all the way back to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, the Hebrews were to work six days and rest on the seventh. In fact, mm -hmm. when you go to the land of Israel, in various public establishments like hotels and so forth, mm -hmm. there's what's called a Shabbat elevator. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it lets you off on every single floor. If you're on floor 10, it mm -hmm. lets you off on floor 9, then floor 8, then floor 7. And I first got on one of those things, and I thought one of those pesky kids yeah. had gotten in there playing the same. Hit all those buttons. Same, and I never did that as a youth. I'm no. pure. I'm pure. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got on it again, and gosh, those pesky kids got on here again. <laughs> then you start to figure out, well, this elevator is designed this way. Well, why would they do that? <clears throat> because they don't want the elevator operator to work and press buttons on the Sabbath. Yeah. So they created one yep. where no button pushing is needed. Yep. And that's why God, uh, Christ tells the Jews halfway through the tribulation period, pray that your flight into the Transjordan mm -hmm. to be protected from the Antichrist and mm -hmm. Satan, mm -hmm. pray that it does not take place on the, in the winter or on the Sabbath because traveling is going to be difficult, if not impossible. Right. Now, this can't be talking to the church because the church does not worship Christ on the last day of the week. Right. They worship the resurrected Christ on the first day of the week. Where are we getting this from? Can you prove that, Pastor? <laughs> Acts 20, <laughs> verse 7. See if you have that. Let's see. Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. 
people complain about my preaching being too long. They do. He, I know that. <laughs> he went on until midnight. And when did this happen? Mm. It happened on the first day of the week. That's right. Not the Sabbath. Right. Not day six, Saturday. Day one, Sunday. That's right. Uh, can you read 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2? Absolutely. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. Now, when is the collection to be taken? On the first day of every week. First day of the week. The church meets on the first day of the week. <clears throat> Israel has had their Sabbath on the last day of the week. That's right. So what's our point? Uh, this whole thing, Matthew 24, is all about the nation of Israel. That's yes. our, that's our yes. point. When you look at the background mm -hmm. of all of these verses. Now, keep in mind, uh, Brother Jim, uh, something else. As we mentioned, the chapter division here is artificial. Yes. So what comes out of chapter 24 needs to be connected with chapter 25. Right. Because as we explained mm -hmm. earlier, this is all one discourse. Mm -hmm. So if the first part of this concerns the nation of Israel, mm -hmm. what do you think we ought to do with the part of it that's recorded in chapter 25? Should we all of a sudden make that for the church and the rapture? No. That would be a bit, <laughs> that would be a bit inconsistent. <laughs> yes. Whatever you're doing in <clears throat> chapter 24 is binding on what you're doing in chapter 25. Right. So having said all that, what in the world is going on in Matthew 25, which follows Matthew 24. It does. A lot of people are still teaching that this parable of the ten virgins is related to the worthy Christians being taken in the rapture. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of interesting that these, uh, those, you know, that are divided between five and five, they're called not the bride, they're called the bridesmaids. Mm-hmm. Now, if this is the church, we just got demoted. Yes, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> we, we went from the status of being the bride of Christ to all of a sudden being a bridesmaid. So this can't be talking about the church. Ephesians no. 5, 22-33 is very clear that our status before Christ is the bride of Christ. Yes. Do you see in Matthew 25, 1-13 anything related to the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, as Paul explains it. Do you see the expression that Paul uses about 99 times to describe the age of the church being in Christ? No. No such concept exists. Mm -hmm. This is Our point is this is still about Israel. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything here related to the rapture? No. Do you see anything related to people being caught up into the heavens? No the way Paul describes the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Do you see anything here related to resurrection? No. Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58, that the rapture is the point in time in which the church-age believer receives their resurrected body. Mm -hmm. So there's no such rapture concept in here at no. all. Mm -hmm. In fact, the bridegroom is not <clears throat> coming from heaven to the earth, he's meeting these bridesmaids or ten virgins on the earth. He's mm -hmm. not meeting them in the sky somewhere. Right. The way the rapture is described. Right. And beyond that, if you're going to turn this into the rapture and you're going to make it sound as if only the worthy Christians are going to be taken in the rapture, then none of these folks should have been taken. Because as we mentioned in verse 5, all of them fell asleep. They sure did. So there should be a rapture for none of them. <laughs> That's right. Amen? Yeah. Now, what's being said here is the ones with the oil, they say, oh, the oil is the Holy Spirit. Right. So the ones with the oil that were prepared, <clears throat> those are the believers. The ones with, uh, without the oil that were unprepared, that's the uh, carnal Christians, if you want to call mm. them that, that are left behind. In fact, I don't even see the word Christian no. here. Mm. Uh, no. The word Christian starts to get developed at Antioch. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Acts 11, around verse 28, but mm -hmm. that concept is not here at all. He's not dealing with Christian church age concepts at all. And by the way, if you have a scenario in your mind where some people have the Holy Spirit within the church and other people don't, you don't understand the doctrine of the church. That's right. The only way you can get into the church by way of spiritual baptism is through faith alone in Christ alone. 
That's right. If that hasn't happened to you, it doesn't matter where you sit on Sunday morning, right. what pew you fill, uh, you're, you're not part of the church, right? right? You mm -hmm. may be part of a club or a group, but you're not part of the body of Christ. And do you have uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13? I do. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So if you're... <laughs> If, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a believer. That's, that's right. And what does Paul say to all of the believers within the church in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51? Keep in mind, he says this to the Corinthian church. Yeah. Yeah, he's talking to the Corinthian Now, church. the Corinthian church, how would you like to be the pastor of the church at Corinth? Uh, first of all, these folks are saved. How do we know that? Do you have 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2? Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, talking about these crazy Corinthians. He says, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So he's dealing with people that have already been baptized into the body of Christ right. through spiritual baptism. Mm -hmm. They're already sanctified. Yep. They're already saints. Yep. But, you know, Brother Jim, they're not acting very saintly, are they? They're no. not living according to their position. Right. Chapters 1 through 4, there's divisions in the church yep. as they're following their favorite teachers who had the best oratorical style. Mm-hmm. Chapter 5, there's incest taking place within this church of the kind that doesn't even take place amongst pagans, a type of immorality. Imagine that. In chapter 6, there's uh, prostitution. They're, they're visiting the temple prostitutes yep. and taking the Holy Spirit into that sexual immorality. Yep. They're also suing each other yep. in chapter 6. Chapter 7, there's rampant divorce and remarriage. Chapters, that's chapter 7. Chapters 8 through 10, the stronger brothers are flaunting their freedoms in the presence of the weaker brothers and mm -hmm. stumbling them. Mm -hmm. Chapters 12 through 14, there's all kinds of imbalances about spiritual gifts yeah. as the tongue talkers are being put on a pedestal. <clears throat> yep. Chapter 15, they're denying resurrection. Yeah. How would you like to be the pastor of this group? We better and, quit complaining. And, and then, yet, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51? Here's what he says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. You see the repetition of the word all? I do. The, despite the fact that these folks were in a carnal state, yep. if the rapture had occurred in their lifetime yep. because they were in Christ by way of faith, mm -hmm. they would all be involved in it. Why? Yes. Because the rapture is given as part of the grace package to the church. Yes, I like that. Unmerited mm -hmm. favor. Amen. That's where you go to develop your rapture concept. Mm -hmm. Not Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Amen. Uh, Paul never taught a partial rapture. Right. Uh, the way people are abusing the parable of the ten virgins to teach a partial rapture. So if we can put up slide seven, what in the world is the parable of the ten virgins talking about? See, as you look at slide number seven, that's our prophecy chart, there's going to be the age of the church, that parenthetical area that we're living in today, and it will be concluded with the rapture. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul's dealing with. Right. And that's what Christ is dealing with in John 14, 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. Then comes the tribulation period, the conversion of Israel. And you have survivors of the tribulation period from Matthew 24, 22. I think we read that last week. But it's very clear that they're going to be survivors of the tribulation period, believing Jews and believing Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And as they make it to the end of the tribulation period, as Christ's second advent happens at the end of the tribulation period, as he's seated on David's throne in Jerusalem, he's mm -hmm. got to determine which of these survivors are believers and which ones are unbelievers. Right. 
And he is doing a separation here yes. mm -hmm. between believing Israel mm -hmm. and unbelieving Israel, mm -hmm. all of which survived the tribulation period. Many of them killed, but apparently there's a lot of survivors right. uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And he's making a determination which ones are saved and which ones are unsaved. Right. The saved ones go into the millennial kingdom. The unsaved ones are cut off, uh, cast off the earth into mm -hmm. judgment. That's where you fit the parable of the ten virgins. Right. It's not talking about rapture, which right. happened at least seven years or more mm -hmm. before. It's talking about the division mm -hmm. between believing Israel and unbelieving Israel. Yes. At, for the survivors that happen to be Jewish mm -hmm. at the end of the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. So the so the wise ones are believers who enter the kingdom. Mm -hmm. The unwise ones are unbelievers who are cast off the earth into judgment. No, right. Nothing to do with the rapture of the church here. Right. Is this is this clear or confusing? It, it really is. Okay. Now, is this division between believing and unbelieving Israel, is this a reality? Can you read? And I believe the audience uh, would have understood these verses that Christ is indirectly uh, referencing here. Mm -hmm. See, see the background of the parable of the ten virgins is the division between believing and unbelieving Israel at the end of the tribulation period, mm -hmm. something that they, the Hebrews should have known well of because mm -hmm. it's spoken of by their own prophets. Right. One of the clearest ones is Zechariah 13 and verses <clears throat> 8 and 9. All right, Zechariah 13, verses 8 through 9. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people." And they will say, the Lord is my God. Two parts perish of Israel. Mm -hmm. one, thir one part or mm -hmm. a third yeah. left in it. Yeah. And that's what's happening with, uh, that's what's being alluded to, mm -hmm. uh, referenced in the parable of the ten virgins. Yes. Uh, the separation between believing and unbelieving Israel at mm -hmm. the end of the tribulation period. Amen. And, People aren't given this explanation, so they're put in a state of fear mm -hmm. that they're going to somehow miss the rapture. Yep. And they're using this parable to teach that. In fact, the parable isn't even dealing with that subject. That's right. our point. Yes. In fact, this division between believing and unbelieving Israel, you'll find it over in also Ezekiel 20, <clears throat> 34 through 38. All right, Ezekiel chapter 20, 34 through 38. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will enter into judgment Judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. So this is dealing not with the end of the church age. No but the end of the inner advent age. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you say, well, does your interpretation fit with the rest of the book, rest of the discourse? Yes, because that's the same thing Jesus is going to do for the Gentiles. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In the sheep and goat judgment. Yes. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Mm -hmm. If you're under a teaching that's taking the parable of the ten virgins and using it to teach a partial rapture, concept, you're under someone who is dispensationally misapplying mm -hmm. the scripture. That's right. They're taking a passage aimed at Israel, mm -hmm. and they're dispensationally misapplying mm -hmm. it to the church. That's and right. So that's what we're, we're talking about here. Now, very quickly, and we're getting ready to wrap up, 
So if you've got a comment or question that you'd like to ask us, uh, put that on the comment box on Facebook, and we'll be trying to get to those in, in just a minute. If you are in Christ, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you don't have to worry about missing the rapture. That's right. First of all, you shouldn't say, I hope I'm worthy to participate in the rapture. Because if you're a believer in Christ and you're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, you're already worthy. Mm -hmm. Because the worthiness that's been given to you has come from the transferred righteousness of Christ right. to your account. Right. Philippians chapter 3, mm -hmm. verse 9. Now, if you want to be concerned about something, you don't need to be concerned about missing the rapture. What you need to be concerned about is what happens after the rapture. Right. So, can we put up slide number 8, uh, a very important verse, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. And I'm looking here at the clock. I don't, have, I don't know how much time we're going to have to develop this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. I've got it right here. Uh, oh, you got it? Jim, okay. Yeah. And that's slide number 9. <clears throat> all right, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We... Paul put himself in that group, mm -hmm. must, this is not optional, mm -hmm. all, all church-age believers mm -hmm. appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's what you ought to be concerned about. Right. Because at the judgment seat of Christ, if we can put up slide number nine, there's going to be rewards given or not given. This has nothing to do with salvation, which is eternally secure. It has yes. to do with rewards Praise given God. or not given based on how we allowed the Lord's resources to express themselves through us during our earthly sojourn mm -hmm. prior to death or prior to the rapture. Yes. Five crowns will be given. Uh, you can see them there on the screen. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27, the incorruptible crown for the believer that is not sinless but sins less. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20, the crown of rejoicing for the soul winner. James 1, 12, Revelation 2, 10, the crown of life for the believer that endures trials under God's grace. Mm -hmm. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4, the crown of glory for the believer that faithfully shepherds God's people. 2 Timothy 4, 8, the crown of righteousness given to the believer that is longing uh, for the appearance of Christ. And Brother Amen. Jim, if we look at slide 10, what do, we, what do you think we do with those... Uh, Rewards. Hoard them. <laughs> Put them in our uh, bank vault. Yeah, in a display case. Yeah, polish them. Uh, kind of have, a, have them there as a display case in my office as I walk, as people walk in and they right. can be impressed right next by to me. all my degrees. Uh, next to all my degrees, yeah. yeah. And what have, those, what have those degrees done for us? Well, they've educated us beyond our intelligence in many cases. <laughs> But what do we do with those Certainly in crowns, my case. Brother Jim? <laughs> Revelation 4, verse 10. All right, Revelation 4, verse 10. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. See, these are abilities, apparently, that we have to glorify Christ throughout all eternity. Mm by taking our crowns and casting them, mm. you know, at, at his feet. And you know, you might have made a quick point please, the other day please. about how this isn't just a one-time thing. Yeah. It says forever and ever we're going to be doing this. Yeah, and in fact, it's whenever the worship uh, in heaven mm -hmm. is taking place, which yeah. I don't think is once. No. We're no. doing this with our crowns. Yeah. So I, I used to think you take your crown and you throw it at his feet yeah. and then it's gone. Yeah. Well, how is that your crown? Mm-hmm. I mean, it would be his crown. Mm -hmm. This is your crown, but mm -hmm. it's not in a narcissistic sense. Mm -hmm. It's a capacity to glorify God throughout all eternity. Amen. If you want to be focused on the future, I wouldn't be looking at the parable of the ten virgins. No. And building your eschatology from that, I'd be mm. building it from this judgment seat of rewards, sometimes called the Bama seat judgment of Christ, yes. following the rapture. If you look at slide 11, we're convinced for a lot of reasons and Folks might want to get into my Revelation series where I drill down deeper on this. Absolutely. But we're, we're convinced that the 24 elders is a reference to the previously raptured church. Mm -hmm. 
And it's sort of interesting that when you get biblical snapshots of the heavenly scene in Isaiah or other places, uh, you never see the 24 elders. No, you don't. But you see them all of a sudden here mm -hmm. uh, in the tribulation period as it's taking place on the earth. And the reason we think the 24 elders represent the church is they're described exactly the way the church is described in mm -hmm. Revelation 2 and 3 and also in other places of Scripture. So this is why we're told, um, and I had, oh, I don't know, slides 12 through 17 on this, which I don't think we're going to get to. Uh, but this is why we're told in Scripture, make sure that no one takes your crown, mm -hmm. Revelation 3.11. Right. Second John 8, watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you receive a full reward. Mm -hmm. Paul expresses concern that he himself will not be disqualified for the prize. Mm -hmm. Should he go back to the flesh? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, Paul explains that there are going to be many Christians who are going to enter heaven, but will not be rewarded at all. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 14 and 15. And keep in mind, folks, that this, is, this has nothing to do with your security in Christ. Right. This is the dealing with the subject of rewards. Since Jesus in John 10, verses 27 through 29, says we're in His hand. Amen. And nothing can snatch us out. So all of that, folks, to sort of demonstrate today that I hope this um, adds some kind of perspective to your beliefs in the end times. I mm -hmm. hope you've not bought into a partial rapture concept thinking that if the rapture happens when you're in a backslidden state or you didn't pray enough that week that you're going to be left behind right because the bible doesn't teach that correct if you're using the parable of the ten virgins to support that mm. idea you're misusing the parable you're disconnecting it from the context which all concerns the nation mm -hmm. of israel yeah your preoccupation should be what's going to happen after the rapture. Right. And you want to be fully rewarded. Yes. And that's why you want to be living for Christ under His power now. I think yeah. that kind of sums up uh, what Amen. we were trying to cover. That's good stuff. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to add to oh, that? I, I just like that. I, I, you know, I know having grown up with this this false teaching about the, the ten virgins that... You grew up with that? Oh, oh absolutely, yeah. yeah See, and that, that sort of proves... Yeah that we're not picking on any particular no, conference speaker. No. These are common misunderstandings floating around. Well, you know, last week when we were talking about the two, first two points, I mean, every one of these three points we, we've discussed are all things that I grew up dealing with yeah. at one point in time in my life. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's I know that there are people out there who are trying to force this meaning on unsuspecting believers, and the thing that we're trying to do here in this session and last week's last time session is is bring freedom and deliverance yes. to you, yes. so that you can walk in grace and not under some form of man-made law. Yes, which puts you into a theological earthquake. Oh, it does. It just it just Second really reason. does. It, it just shakes you to your core. Yeah, and some <clears> some <throat> folks are mistaught these things very early on in their Christian oh, life, yeah. That's and they right. ne they never really shake it. Uh, I was taught. Yeah. Very early. So, yes. And we have a witness out here in our studio audience. Can I get a witness? I just saw a hand that went up. Yeah. I see that hand. We've got a handful here of, of uh, comments and questions. We'll do these very fast. One person says, happy birthday, Brother Jim. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you. You all didn't know it was Brother Jim's birthday. So, happy 37th. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, that's right, brother. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and another one says, does anybody have a good write-up? on the fact that all seven years of the tribulation period is God's wrath. And I think there is a good write-up. I think it's the Apostle John. I think the Apostle John writes really well on this subject because he says in Revelation 7, verse 14, concerning the ministry of the 144,000, which are converted towards the beginning of the tribulation mm -hmm. period, Revelation 7, 1 through 3, mm -hmm. And I said to them, my Lord, and he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. Whoa. So the whole shawarma <laughs> is the great tribulation. 
I think a very good write-up also is John in Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17, where he says the great day of their wrath has come. Those are the seal judgments at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus talks about the great tribulation for Israel in the second half, Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. So do you know of a better write-up than that? I can't think of any. I think John gave a fantastic write-up. I think that's a, that's a good write-up right there. Another person says, I always took the parable of the ten virgins, sort of like I took the parable of the wheat and the tares. I never took it as a rapture verse. I just took it as five or six or, let's see, five or six. I think she, this person meant to say five are saved and five are unsaved. Mm-hmm. The soils represent the Holy Spirit looking forward to what you have to say. Well, if you get my book, The Coming Kingdom, I spend a lot of time on those Matthew 13 parables. Right. And those also are inner Advent age parables, which sort of overlap with the church age, I believe, but extend Mm -hmm. beyond the church age into the second Advent. And Mm -hmm. when the sifting happens... That's not talking about the rapture. That's talking about the second advent at the Mm -hmm. end of the tribulation Mm -hmm. period. So I appreciate that comment. Another person says, So we are the body now and the bride in heaven, right? Question mark. Well, I think what happens when the rapture occurs and we go into the Father's house for seven years is there's going to be the judgment seat of rewards. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's the Bema Seat Judgment. And this, by the way, fits very well with the Hebrew wedding sequence. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Jews were married in this kind of order. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's another discussion in and of itself, so we won't go too far there. But in heaven, you have the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. And then you have the joining of the groom to the bride. Right. And now this is the marriage of the Lamb. Right. And then we descend with Christ at the end of the seven years to the earth with him, Mm -hmm. Revelation 19, as now the wife of Mm -hmm. the Lamb, no Mm -hmm. longer the bride uh, Mm -hmm. of Christ. Is that your understanding? Yeah, absolutely. And then the marriage Mm -hmm. supper will take place on the earth. Mm -hmm. Marriage in heaven, marriage supper on the earth. That's my basic understanding. Uh, what would you add to that? Or no, it, well, it follows the pattern of yes. the Jewish wedding. Yes. So uh, there's been a, there's a lot out about that. So and there's about ten there's about ten steps to a Hebrew wedding. Yeah. yeah. One more person says, "My cup <clears throat> runs over." Oh, this is great. I, we love hearing these kind of we love hearing all the remarks. But when someone is liberated from uh, bondage, mm-hmm. that that really brings us great joy. This person says, "My cup runs over. I am filled with such joy." with this teaching. So many questions have been answered. My heart and mind have been put at rest by being able to understand these truths. Mm. I thank God for Mm. both of you. Hallelujah. Now, Pastor? Yes, sir. Just before we did this session, did we not have a staff prayer time? Yes, we did. Did we not specifically pray that that would take place? Yes, we did. God answers prayer, folks. Yes, he does. And this is why we do what we do. Yes. The only reason. And it's not just us doing it. You guys can't see our two smiling members of our studio audience who really are not a studio studio audience. They kind of function as a studio audience every once in a while by giving us some unique emotions and signs. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) But one of them is monitoring the the comments on Facebook. That's right. The other one's running the camera. And all the graphics you see being weaved in and out, they're being monitored. So. This is exciting for us, all of us in the room, because this is why we do what we do. So thank you for Mm -hmm. the warm concerns. Yeah, and and pray for these folks behind the scenes, too, because, you know, you see us, but you don't see them, and they really work hard to make this happen. Yeah, and the devil is attacking our AV ministry constantly. Oh, all the time. In terms of technical glitches and all kinds of things go wrong. So keep us in prayer. Amen. Um, By the way, the entire studio audience, we had two interruptions, so things are complete. Okay. We had, uh, speaking of interruptions, apparently we had two. I guess we didn't pray hard enough in the staff meeting. <laughs> must have forgot that day. But don't panic. <clears throat> don't fret. The whole th- an uninterrupted uh, episode today is going to be uploaded very, very fast 
onto our YouTube channel without any glitches whatsoever. Praise the Lord. So we would remind you, therefore, by way of conclusion, to go to our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Just type into your YouTube search engine, Andy Woods, Pastor's Point of View, mm -hmm. and it should pop right up there. And there's a playlist uh, entitled Pastor's Point of View, and you can get all of our Pastor's Point of View episodes, including this one, which is going to be uploaded there momentarily. Uh, if you are a, if you're watching us on Facebook, which obviously everybody that's within the sound of my voice at this particular point in time, 3.21 p.m. is watching us on Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, we would invite you to click like and share. Yes. We're asking that you like us literally and metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And if you click share... All of a sudden, you expand the influence of this ministry into people that we don't have access to, that's right. your friends list. That's right. And so that's just a very small thing you can do mm -hmm. uh, to expand uh, what you believe the Lord is doing in this particular ministry. Amen. Um, I would also invite you to check out the app, Grace Global, Global Radio. Global Radio. Yeah, GGR, Grace Global Radio. Radio, which features 24-7, free of charge, expositional Bible teaching, verse by verse. In other words, you don't get on there unless you teach the Bible verse by verse. Right. Mm -hmm. And you don't get on there unless you understand grace mm -hmm. and how it's different than lordship salvation. Right. And you don't get on there unless you understand the concept of dispensations. Right. So you're going to get exposed to a lot of people doing what we're doing here rightfully dividing the Word of God. Amen. So you're not put into bondage. Amen. And uh, if Amen. you want to know where some safe space is, all these millennials want their safe space, mm. GGR is safe space. And not just for the millennials, it's safe space for me. I need some safe space, Brother Jim. What do you think about that? I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're interested in some seminary education, uh, I would invite you to check out Chafer. Theological Seminary, where we're going to teach you to exegete the Word of God and teach it verse by verse. Yes. And we offer 30-unit uh, degrees, 60-unit degrees, a full-blown THM. And uh, you don't have to be victimized by liberal seminary professors anymore. Right. Because we have an alternative for you. www.chafer, C-H-A-F-E-R, Dot edu named after the very famous Lewis Sperry Chafer. Now, and that's an online program, isn't it? Yeah, we do online. We do distance mm -hmm. learning. That whole yeah. whole thing. And we've got a somebody there in our office that can't wait to take your call, so you can learn more about it. Amen. Uh, in closing, brother Jim, do you have anything to say? Well, all I can say is I appreciate the teaching today, and we appreciate you folks out there. We, we appreciate, as the saying goes, your cards and letters. Keep them coming in, so to speak. We love you. We pray for you. And uh, we just look forward to seeing you every time we get together. All right. Well, God bless you, and we'll see you next week. God bless.